How did you find your product market fit? Let's start with Emir. Thank you, Adi. So before we go to the, our question, we would like to answer the question from Aditya Wikara. For Edwin, you mentioned having partnerships with EPC. Is, is that only for construction or also procurement? You mentioned having PV engineers, so I assume Surya does the consulting or engineering. Also, your website says Surya lease tanpa DP or Surya lease without down payment. Could you explain a bit about this, uh, a bit on this? Are you financing the system for customers? Right. Um, so let me answer like one by one. So we do have like a partnerships with EPC for both for construction and part of procurement. Um, we don't, uh, we typically like to procure like our own uh, major components such as like a modules or inverters. Um, that's just because like those are the ones that are imported and like we do have like a leverage like when importing like a large quantity because we typically like we have like a several projects and then like the EPCs like it's shared by like a different APCs because you know they have like a, only like an X number of like a manpower, um, and like a, for us like a, we can just pull them together, buy like a big amount of like a, a components and like a get it at a much deeper like a discount, um, especially like for imports. Um, so yes, we do offer like a procurement too, but typically are like a for locally made like a components. We do have PV engineers. Uh, we invest a lot in like having good PV engineers. We so yes, you're right. We do the consulting and like we do the engineering. Um, so typically, like we do like the preliminary design that kind of captures like the essence of like what we want to see inside a uh, solar system. We do adopt a uh, design for operations. This is a philosophy that says in the next whatever, however I design this. It has to be optimized such that in the next 20 years, 30 years, it's easy for me to operate and to maintain the plant. So I will not optimize the yield, like the amount of electricity. I will optimize like uh, how effortless, like uh, our maintenance are gonna be done like uh, for the next 30 years. Um, so that has to be captured in the preliminary design. And then like uh, later on, like uh, as we start to construct the project and all that, like our PV engineers, We'll still like uh, work together with our EPCs to make sure the installations are done properly. Um, so serial lease without like a down payment. Yes. So this is like a, one of the key things that we learn from customers in Indonesia. Like I said, um, Indonesian customers, especially like the commercial and industrial, are very thrifty, and um, I think all of them. I've never seen one of them that uh, would like to install solar without. Uh, with with a with down payment even, or like they wouldn't even like purchase them like themselves. So we provide them with like an operating lease. Uh, we help them uh, finance like the system uh, in the next like 30 years. Uh, Arya, I think like you yeah. mute. Another question for you, Edwin. So how, how does Surya differentiate itself to both investors and end users? In a solar world, where there are already major established companies that have strong financials themselves? Um, to investors first, um, I think like we are the local, your local asset management company or like your local solar company. And um, it's really easy for us. Look at our success rate. We have 20 plus projects with like uh, more than 80 megawatts uh, pipelines. And uh, we have a pretty high success rate in Indonesia. Um, I think like that's a good enough, like a reason for like investors to like invest in us. <laughs> um, compared with like say, I mean like a name, a name the big names. Um, and then I could try to uh, count like how many projects they have already have in Indonesia. Um, I think um, that, that says for itself, now, um, for the end users, I think um, it is like our product that's like a tailor to their need is the one that um, that makes us different. Uh, Indonesian customers tend to really care about like after sales. We do provide, we, we have like our office here 
we provide like 24 seven like the support and um, we do give you know like uh, what 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 gonna happen like if there's an emergency we, we already have like established like all the protocols and we do work our engineers like work very very closely with our customers when we design the system so i think like at this kind of um close one-to-one -one interaction between our engineers and like the customers are like what set us different and like how we are able to like provide quality service that we have provided so far okay and there's further question from aditya vikara adding on does this mean that you have partnerships with financial institutions because i assume the upfront costs for commercial or initial projects are very high well we do have partnerships with like uh, investors i probably like i wouldn't say like a too much about it uh, because of confidentiality but yes we do have like our instruments okay thank you thank you Edwin. so we'll get the next question from us is what is the trend for renewable energy looking forward let's start with emir i think it's i mean that's why we started recent it's um digitalization is basically not just uh, plugging the um, uh, cables and you know pumping the energy into the um, central bus bar but it's about understanding which energy is pumped how to pump it because as you know the solar is very intermittent energy source despite it's being a renewable and sustainable um and solar can't sustain by itself so you need to combine it either with battery, you need to combine it either with diesel generator or combine it with a grid. So in order to be able to do so, you need to be able to synchronize multiple energy assets and to understand which of the sources is more cheaper, which of the sources is more reliable, and to ensure that you're constantly monitoring those uh, aspects. And that comes with re uh, digitalization. That's basically what we do, energy management solution. But at the same time, we try to integrate other assets which are not related to the energy production only so we basically integrate different sensors so for example when you deal with the smart building so let's say basic um solar installation you integrate pyranometer then you try to understand how the weather conditions are affecting your solar performance and how you can forecast your solar performance and how you can plan your energy assets um in terms of the consumption and generation for the next one hour for the next three hours for the next one day for example and that helps customers in order to do different type of things when i don't know if most of you heard but it's called demand response where basically um you there's a generation of the energy and there is a consumption it always has to be perfect balance between these two so consumption is coming from the customer generation coming from the different energy sources be it's a grid solar or battery or diesel generator so in order to understand how to balance it well need to be synchronized both assets so basically generation and consumption and this is what we started doing so that's what we do for smart building and when you try to synchronize consumption is basically you dealing with a human behavior because people are comfortable with 25 degrees of air con some people are with 27 and we need to find a perfect way when they're comfortable with 25 and when they're comfortable with 27. Um, so these are the things that we're playing with we're trying to control their loads but without disrupting their comfortability um, but at the same time to ensure that they have most efficient, most cost benefit from their energy systems. So I think going forward for renewables and in general for sustainability, I mean, if you ask me for renewables, I would say um, prices of solar dropping drastically for the past couple of years, let's say let's last 10 years. But the reason for that dropping is of course, everyone becoming cost efficient, cost efficient. Most of the solar panel manufacturing is going towards uh, China, uh, but then US put, um, sort of like embargo, it's an uh, anti-dumping uh, tax system where basically Chinese goods can be sold directly at the price that they're selling. There should be a taxation in order to maintain the competitive market in the world. Um, so uh, manufacturing cost is of course dropped drastically, but at the end of the day, I mean, solar is limited by the silicon uh, raw material. So there will be always a saturation point where if they won't be able to go uh, lower than that. And when it comes to that point, um, then it, it comes um, to, the, to, the, to the point where you need to improve other aspects. And other aspects will be how to combine different energy assets, how to synchronize them, and how to use them efficiently. Do you see that there will be some um, lower in the cost as well for, for, for solar right now? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it will it will definitely uh, go lower because when you, uh, I mean, manufacturing of the solar is very difficult to bring it even lower, uh, unless you know uh, you want to spoil the market. Uh, you just basically pump in the money, take loans, and etc. to maintain the uh, we call it um, uh, superior solar manufacturer. But then once all other companies are, you know, not uh, they can't sustain the cost. You start to increase your cost effic uh, effectively, um, but at the end of the day, you are, they are they will be saturated at around thirty cents. I think twenty five to thirty cents per uh, per megawatt. Uh, but no, not, not twenty five thirty cents manufacturing cost per uh, per watt. Um, and then when you do LCOE calculation, it basically depends. It's a levelized cost of electricity. It depends on your entire EPC, basically where you buy, uh, where you want to install. Uh, what type of manpower you are using, how you're synchronizing, how the sunlight in the area where you basically, Edwin knows more about it, um, how to calculate how much of energy you will be withdrawing for the next 20 years, what is degradation of your energy assets year to year, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, effectively it will go down, um, but not too much. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. How about you, Edwin? Thank you. Yeah, I think like I would, um, I share like a lot of like the opinions that um, Amir like has shared. Uh, I do personally believe that um, integrating like IoT into like our energy grid, uh, power grid is like uh, going to be like the big trend um, uh, becoming like, basically like we would need to like establish like a smart, uh, smart grid. Um, but I think before that, we will establish like a more and more integrated like energy source first. Uh, the solar is one of them. Um, as we can see, also uh, wind, uh, wind solar farms like uh, in power possibility too. And then like, probably like we're going to move on to like a smart grid, um, particularly for Indonesia. Probably like a, some more like a power conditioning too. Again, like it can be helped with like the help of like a data and like uh, IoT. And then um, in terms of um, uh, other uh, non-grid related, um, maybe like I said, like uh, the, the price of like a solar modules will not go that far, but then a big uh, bank for the buck will keep increasing. Um, so right now the price for like a solar module is like a below like 25 cents uh, per watt already. Uh, it's like a 10 times lower than like when I was like in grad school trying to like cut it down from four dollars to like one dollar one. Um, there will be like a more technologies related to like a solar cells. Um, so in the near future, like it won't be like dominated by silicon. Probably like a flexible solar cells gonna be like a more incorporated, like the perovskites, the organics, uh, you name it. Um, when that like hits market, um, I think like it will be really really game changing because now solar will not be only a, um, a source of, you know, like a solar farm or a, uh, uh, for your rooftops, but like it may become something that's a little bit more integrated to like your daily life, like uh, become solar wearables, for example, like um, because like uh, the potential, like all that, all these uh, flexible solar cells is immense. It's tremendous. Like it can be incorporated to your, uh, to your fabric, for example. For your clothing and so on and so forth. Um, in Indonesia, we think um, the future is bright for like a renewable energy in general. Legal like a framework is getting stronger and better, and like it seems like it will be like a little bit more favorable towards renewable energy like a deployment uh, for sure. Um, the government is very serious. Market demand is also increasing like in the last two years. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, there's a new law on renewable energy that um, hopefully gonna come out soon. And like uh, it will make it easier to do renewable projects in Indonesia. And of course, like Surya ourselves are exploring ways to diversify, um, or diversify our business to support continuous development of renewable energy. So um, we are thinking about like how can we support, like I said, like the power quality, help like a PLN like improve like their power quality and also like how to help them like achieve like a smart grid and therefore like a better, more stable like a grid of course in the nation. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Edwin. So the last question that we usually ask, we always ask actually, we always ask our guests, 
is that of all the experience that you've had from the past, uh, what is the key takeaway being a founder? I mean, we can start with, with Edwin first. Key takeaway. I mean, like, can it be something that you want to share with the future entrepreneurs or someone who wants to be an entrepreneur or anything? I mean, just a key takeaway from being a founder, entrepreneur. Drew Beck, think about your business plan carefully. Have a really good business plan. Don't just, you know, oh, I think this is cool. No. Do, do your like a research on your business plan very carefully. And then just do it. I've seen like a lot of people like a dream big and like a day don't do like a business plan properly. I've seen like a lot of people like I have like amazing business plan, but they just stop short of like actually doing it. So I think those three dream big, be serious in your business plan and do it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. How about you, Emir? Uh yeah, I would say just be motivated, believe in yourself, believe in your idea, believe in your team. Most importantly, I think to choose the right team. I, I think I mentioned it before as well. And this is really, really important because uh, there will be days when you go down, there will be days when you'll be too happy. And I think team helps you to balance that off um, and, you know, keep you on the track to do the right thing. And whenever they feel down or whenever they feel too, too happy, uh, you basically try to do the same thing for them. So uh, I would say team is really important. Um, and I really learned that team is basically everything when you start a company, when you try to bring it uh, to a certain level and to grow it. But of course, saying that, don't be blinded by the ideas as well. I mean, we all have the ideas. And as Edwin said, we always need to do our homework, need to prepare a business case, need to understand that this idea really works. So don't suffer for nothing. You know, it's like, uh, some people just go with idea and then uh, even though it doesn't make much sense, um, always be flexible, be uh, ensure that um, you're always ready to pivot uh, if it makes sense. Uh, so that's those three, I guess, the most important takeaways. So would you agree with, with why we did this, why we do this uh, web webinar is because like entrepreneurship can be lonely journey? Of course, I mean, it's really important to, to have these webinars and, um, you know, talks and sharing sessions because uh, we always learn. It doesn't matter if you are 20s, you are 40s, you are 50s, 70s. Uh, we always learn. Uh, we always take um, different notes for ourselves from different experiences, from different people. Uh, it might work for us. It might not work for us, but it's a continuous learning curve for any entrepreneur, I think, in the market. Um, so it's definitely really, really helpful to have this type of webinars and sharing sessions. Okay. And thanks Thank for having you. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that will be the last question before the closing by Ardi. I would like to say thank you to Amir and also to Edwin. So uh, thank you. thanks for, for allocating some of your time, busy hours, very late for you as well in, in Singapore. It's okay. Amir. So thank you so much. I will let Ardi close, the, close this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thanks again, uh, Edwin and Emir. And Thank you. we actually have some uh, more questions, uh, and, but since the time is uh, not permitted, so yeah. uh, we will post these questions in a separate article. And hopefully you guys st can still answer some of the questions. So Thanks. if there is any more question from... Uh, the other participants, uh, you can fill in the form in the follow-up email. And thank you for all the partners for today's session. And stay tuned to CR.com and CR News YouTube channel for recordings of the event. You can also find us at Dengarkan. It's a podcast platform for iOS and Android. You can, you can find it in, on the uh, Apple Store or the Play Store. And the next episode will be a special episode. And just stay tuned for the update for next week's uh, special episode. Um, we would also like to share with you about our other webinar series called Enterprise Talk. It's every Wednesday, same time. 
we'll di- we'll discuss uh, about uh, standardizing and streamlining operations for businesses in multiple locations with nimbly technologies so that's it from us and see you next time thank you everyone